It's considered normal that life is filled with ups and downs. We chase happiness in relationships, careers, money, and status, sacrificing so much for a ride that ultimately feels meaningless and unfulfilling. We are too stressed, living with too much worry and fear, depressed and frustrated. What if there were another way to live? Spiritually unawake, drift into sleep on the softest bed, on sheets with many threads, thinking of everything I shouldn't have said. These thoughts may leave me in sleep, but now I can't get them out of my head. Just spinning on endless repeat. Holding on to these worries and on to these fears that mean nothing Not now or when we are done I had the normal life. I married my high school sweetheart and we built this life together for 22 years. College degrees, a good job in Seattle, we made a bit of money, went shopping, traveled the world. We even have a beautiful daughter together. But I was depressed, confused and lost. There was no room in my life to be me. I failed in that life and it ultimately fell apart. Just spinning on endless repeat, holding on to these worries and on to these fears that mean nothing, not now or when we are dead. This will kill me and I need to roll. But I'm not sleepy Because tomorrow I'm still Now I live in tomorrow. Slovakia and things are very different. I'm living the simple life with my girlfriend in a small apartment. It doesn't really matter who you are, where you live, or what you do. We are the same in all the ways that matter. The breakthrough happens when you come to know the self-love within. That's when the drama of the ups and downs just stops. This is a film about discovering that eternal love within, awakening to consciousness, finding peace, abundance, and freedom. A different life is possible. Nothing can threaten the truth. Fear, if justified, implies that there is something of value that can be destroyed or lost. To live in truth is to realize there is nothing real to fear because nothing real can be taken from you.
Belief in fear is belief in separation. The illusion that there is a you which is special and different from the rest of the universe. Live according to the world's attempt to destroy truth and risk sacrificing your entire life in service to a lie. But acceptance of truth is the release from all fear, the undoing of all error, the end of suffering, and the fulfillment of your life purpose. The opposite of fear is love. Love is bliss, happiness, creativity, giving, caring, inspiration, laughter, beauty, lightness, and all other positive states of being. There is no miracle beyond love because only love is powerful enough to end all suffering. Acceptance of love is the embrace of spirit and the awareness of life. A Course in Miracles says that only what is loving is true. Love is what you are. All other identities are illusions that cause error. So when I talk about separation, I'm talking about the idea that we as people are separate from each other. And in human history, this wasn't always the case. Back seven or 8,000 years ago, you know, prior to that era, um, humanity was very different. We didn't yet have the sort of developed logical, rational minds that tells us it's possible to own property, to get things from each other, to attack each other. Um, essentially all the things that ego does. So the rise of the ego is the rise of this idea of separation. Before that, we didn't have the voice in the head constantly, um, you know, nagging us, telling us how to get more, how to be more successful, how to impress people, um, blaming and shaming others. You know, we existed in small communities and tribes and we were all together getting along, working together. And for the vast majority of human history, we did not need the idea of separation. We existed in perfect harmony. In fact, a lot of the native peoples, um, you know, the Native Americans and a lot of the Africans and, and, and the tribes in South America, Latin America, prior to the conquest, prior to the settlers coming, um, they existed in this way. And basically a peaceful state of, of harmony with nature, cooperation, of um, a sort of mystical way of seeing the world. Then along comes the Europeans through the Roman civilization and before that the rise of the eagle started somewhere in the desert region of the Middle East and was brought to Europe. And this idea that you could conquer people, that you, that you could have centralized authority governing people, that you'd have law, you'd have property ownership, you'd have marriage between one man and one woman, these are all ideas of separation. So here we are several thousand years later and now the world has been totally taken over by this egoic state, this idea of separation. Pretty much any country in the world has the same system of governance, the same value system, the same you know, consumerist societies. And also the same model of relationships and marriage and family. So the idea is you know, the, the the ego believes you're going to find happiness in some life situation. You're going to get a new car. You're going to find the perfect partner. You're going to have two perfect kids. You're going to have a beautiful home and you're going to have respect for the community, a great job and all these things. And you're going to be happy. The problem is that for those of us who don't get all those things that are lined up, um, we don't feel that, that there's a way to be happy. And for those of us who do, we still aren't happy. We spend how many years trying to pursue happiness this way and never quite achieve it for longer than a short time frame, you know, a great vacation or a great situation. You're first excited for a little while, you're happy for a little while, then the feeling fades and you're back into some sort of depression, isolation, longing for more, worrying about something. And this goes on as long as we continue to believe in 
this idea of separation. Many people spend their whole lives this way, most people do, and they can be even years away or months away from death in old age and still looking for happiness in the future, still telling stories about why they can't be happy um, because of past situations or past things that happened, stories. They spend a whole life never knowing the true identity. This is very tragic in marriages and love relationships and, and families because when you found, when you, when you basically found a relationship on this idea of separation, which is what people do, they say, I love you, therefore I don't want you talking with anyone else or knowing anyone else or going out on your own with anyone else. I don't want you chatting with someone. You might, you know, get seduced or seduce someone. You might do something which makes me jealous. So this is the, in the very beginning, you're, you're, you're establishing a relationship based on rules of separation, separating each other from the world so that you can be together. And of course the idea is that you are supposed to make each other entirely happy, two people, forever, emotionally satisfied and happy, providing everything that you need. Now, in reality, this never works. This is why you see so much resentment and bitterness and nastiness and, and lifelong marriages, older people that are just bickering and fighting even if they're together for 50 years. Now some people do stay together, but not under the conditions of separation. They're happy only if they find a different way to do the relationship. So what happens in a relationship based on separation? You start off with this idea, you start off with the, with the attacks the controlling, the manipulation of each other so that you make sure that you totally possess each other. There's no chance that you, that you have any needs outside the relationship. Everything the person do you have to does, you have to approve, you have to negotiate, you have to share everything. You have this massive control between you. One person usually has more than the other. One person is a bit more abused than the other. One is doing the abusing. But either way, it's a lot of work to do the abusing. It's a lot of work to do the manipulation and controlling. And there's these terrible feelings because you never know whether whether you can trust the person you're with. You're setting all these rules, but as soon as you set a rule, what happens? You say, don't you ever do this with someone else or else I will divorce you. As soon as you make that rule, you can't be sure whether or not your partner is doing that thing because they already know that if they told you, you would divorce, right? So you're ending the possibility of honesty and openness. You're creating a vacuum where there's loneliness, disconnection from each other and from the world, a terrible situation. But this is what the ego says it wants in a relationship. This is what all the movies show us as the model for a relationship. So essentially no one knows a different way. So we all rush into relationships, we fall in love with someone, we feel great, we, we feel genuine love and bliss. And then we start with the rules. We start with these ways of divi defining relationships. And what happens is, no matter how great it might have started out, at some point you're going to start feeling this, this terrible pain of, of isolation and separation from the world, this distance from each other, and you're going to start resenting each other. Resentment is an emotion that has to do with, um, you know, your soul wants to be free and you're with someone who you say you love and yet this person is making you very unfree. You're fearful of this person because in order to impose separation, you have to attack. So both of you are attacking each other. Don't attack me, don't attack me. I am only being who I am. Don't attack me, don't attack me I will not offer no defense When the sun comes up today All I want to do is play Thank you for the times you were my friend You used to be So in love with life that you were free Love will set you free Love will set you free If you stop searching, learn to give Love will set you free
will set you free Unlearn how to wait and learn to live So when the sun comes up today All I want to do is say Everything about you is okay You used to be Blind to what is real but now you see You used to be Blind to what you feel Unable to heal You thought attack was real But this love changed your life And you're singing Don't attack me Don't attack me I am only being who I am Don't attack me Don't attack me Will not offer no defense When the sun comes up today All I want to do is play Thank you for the times you were my friend Feel the energy Come into your life cause you are free Feel the energy Come into your life cause you are free I've been more than eight, eight months pregnant right now and it has been the easiest time of my life so far what's unusual like this and whenever I tell my friends that I'm happy in my relationship they they probably think I'm, I'm hiding something in her or I'm lying and if I explain why if I if I tell all the reasons why they, well, they don't believe me. And they say, well, you should, you should express your needs, you should be bold. Don't ever try to chase perfect story. You have no power to know whether it's good or, good or bad. When I met Mark, for the first time, it didn't make any sense at all why you should like me. <laughs> I was even darkier than I am right now. I was wearing my sports clothes and being super awkward. And <laughs> and he was he was this charming, handsome, eloquent man who came to me and he hugged me with so much love I never thought I deserved that kind of love <laughs> and he gave it to me, he accepted me completely right away not saying about all the other details <laughs> about me he loved me instantly and I did love him instantly with everything he, he is I have a question for you. Yeah. What are rules for? Do you think kids have too many rules? Yeah. At school they do. And at home at too. Home. At home too, but not that many rules. We don't have that much more, that many rules. You can't do anything, uh, everything you want to. But, I mean, I don't know why. When we're young, like five years old or, or younger, we already have everything. We already feel self-love. We feel love for everybody. We trust everyone. We don't worry. We don't have any fear about anything. We just kind of play and life is wonderful. And then we go to first grade and they tell us, okay, now welcome to the real world. We have to get you ready for life. We have, you know, and the whole idea is that someday, someday you're going to earn back all the things that you already had. So they take away your freedom. They take away the idea that you're perfect and, and lovable. Now, in first grade, in second grade, in third grade, now you have to do something to be lovable. Now you have to get good grades. You have to be good to listen to the rules. You have to um, dress right. You have to show up on time. You have to do everything right. And they tell you 
they tell you that you have to do that because someday you're going to finally go through all the school, you're going to graduate, and then what's going to happen? Then you're going to get a good job, right? Mm. And the job's going to be fun, right? Don't you think jobs are fun? Yeah. And but, but not. But sometimes I think of like poor adults. I think I think sometimes kids have better lives because they could kind of be free. Exactly. So adults. And not like adults. Adults can't really be free, can they? Adults have to spend a lot Work. of time working, and so you're told all this. You're told that someday you're gonna get to a place where you have a beautiful house, you're going to have money, you're going to have a car, you're going to have a job, you're going to have a family, and you're going to what? Be happy. You're going to be, you're going to have perfect love. You're how? Not gonna, you're not going to worry. Well, how? Just follow how the rules. You... Follow all the rules. If you follow all the rules, then you'll be perfect, and someday when you're 25 or 35 and you're perfect, <laughs> now... <laughs> now you're worthy of being loved. Now, finally, you can be, feel safe and secure. You'll get to a place where it's didn't, all didn't figured you have that out. Before? <laughs> and the thing is, it's the biggest lie, and it's funny, but it's so sad if you think about it. This is what the world is doing to us. They are taking people who are perfect already, and they're telling them they have to go to school. <laughs> you have no choice. And your parents... And, and that as well. And your they parents turn against you. Your parents turn against you, and they tell you that you better do well in school. Mm. So the people who loved you when you were four and five, many kids, when they go to school, the parents then don't love them unconditionally. They love them conditionally. They say, if you're a good kid, then you get my love. And if you're a bad kid, oh. I don't go to your room and get out of my sight. We, as human beings, are already perfect. We were born that way. We are perfect love. We don't need rules. We don't need threats. We don't need rewards. We just need acceptance and love. And we, of course, we want to learn. We naturally want to learn. Don't you want to do stuff and learn new things and try new things? And yeah. Naturally. And we need a way to learn we need a way to, to create, but schools don't teach that. Schools don't teach how to create. Schools teach how to follow rules, how to listen to the teacher, how to behave exactly the way they tell you to behave, how to fake, how to fake, not to, how to not be you. And they tell you basically that if you keep faking, someday you get to get it, you, you earn it, you know, if you do well enough in high school, Congratulations, now you can go to college, you can fake for four more years. Mm. Do well enough there, you can fake for two or three or four more years after that and go to college even more. Then you can do an internship. Why do you have to go to college twice? You, if you want to get, be a doctor, you have to go for eight years of college just to earn the right to be able to sacrifice even more and sit in a hospital and basically what? do what you're told and follow the rules of the healthcare system and the pharmaceutical companies and you spend your whole life this way and you were promised you were promised that if you become a doctor you're going to be happy and respected what you were promised doesn't come and I've experienced this I went through six years of college I went through it took me until age 30 to understand that it's a lie the jobs don't pay enough money Sitting in anywhere for eight to nine hours a day does not make you happy. It doesn't matter how, what, you, what kind of house you have or what kind of car you have. The way to get what you promise is to know that you have it now. Now. You have that now within you. And it's not external. It's not to be found in a job. It's not to be found in the world. It's not to be given to you by some authority, by some teacher or by some boss. It doesn't come in the shape of a house. It doesn't come in the shape of a car. It doesn't come in the, form, in the form of respect for a title or for money. You already have everything now. And it's always now. I know. You told me that like a few, one year ago, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and people don't say this enough, and people don't know it. 
and they believe the lie. And people pretend that they're happy. They pretend. It looks that way. You see somebody who's dressed perfectly and has perfect car and has the job and they're important going to work on time and they act like everything is perfect, but deep down they're hurting inside. And that's the lie. We lie to each other. We're lied to and then we feel like something is wrong with us when we don't get to that destination. But nobody's ever gotten to any kind of lasting or permanent happiness by following these rules. It has never happened. In the history of humanity, no one's ever gotten there. Even celebrities and famous rock stars and athletes aren't happy because they're famous rock stars. They might be happy, but they would only be happy if they know what we're talking about right now. Then they would be happy. So let's turn this around and let's talk about how if you know that you're already perfect and complete, now life becomes a game. Now you go to school and you say, okay, this is how it is. I accept it. And it's not that hard. It's not that bad. But I'm not going to take it seriously because I have a mom and dad who's on my side. And whatever I do is okay. There's no reward and punishment. But I'm going to probably do pretty good at school, which you do. You do it, you're the best student in your class, aren't you? Mm-hmm. And it's easy. All you have to do is be nice and at least act good. And, um, I mean, I know that you don't have to act good, but you, I mean, people say that you should act good. You don't have to listen, but you do. It's, it's better if you are, and that goes to the first question you had about rules. You don't need rules because you already do want to act good.
so much of our ideas about work are have to do with sacrifice. And this comes from, I guess, a lifetime of education about sacrifice from school uh, to where we're taught to just sit still and listen and then do homework and all this. And that carries on into our work. And so most of what we do, we find jobs that keep us, uh, at least if you're, if you're talking about office jobs, you're, you're, you're kept sort of at your desk and at your computer for something like eight or nine hours a day. And nobody can work the full eight to nine hours every single day. Most people, and I've had many jobs in, in various kinds of offices, and I've never seen, I've never met a person who's worked more than three or four hours a day, and yet they sit there for eight to nine hours a day. So you do two, three, four hours of work every day, just enough to cover your, what you feel, to not feel guilty. And again, work, a job is typically about feeling guilty. It's about feeling ashamed, ashamed of yourself that you haven't, that you haven't um, done enough today and yesterday or this week. And at the same time, you come away completely um, exhausted, just totally exhausted. And you, you go home and, and, and you maybe try to do some kind of hobby for a little while, you make dinner, whatever it may be, but you really don't have any time for, you know, because so much of our energy and time goes into a job, needless to say, we don't have a lot of time for meditation, for, um, you know, for spiritual growth, for pursuing our passions, for even feeling good. So all the things we actually want, a job takes us away from, and we're told that the purpose of a job is to feel safe and secure, and we have our evenings and weekends to live. Um, the problem is you're, you're sacrificing everything, but you're not really getting back what you're promised. I mean, very, many people have good jobs and they make enough money to buy some things and, and, and so forth, but, but almost everyone lives in a state of really uncertainty. You don't know whether, um, you know whether the company's revenue will cover the expenses that lets people go. You don't know if the company's being acquired. You don't know if your job's being changed to something you dislike or if you can tolerate a situation. So there is a lot of uncertainty about the future, this idea of the future, of the stable um, future, which you're, which you're supposedly getting when you are taking a, a good job. And for me, um, you know, I spent many years, even after I, I relocated to Slovakia, I still was working a contract with one employer. And every few years what would happen is that they would change and I would lose the gig. And then you left for six months or whatever it may be, you're left with a lot of uncertainty and, and, and you're having to look for another position. And so you wonder what you're sacrificing for, you know? And I, I came to the conclusion um, after reading Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss, which I highly recommend everyone read, um, you know, <laughs> there's no reason we have to be loyal to one employer or to one gig at a time. So the, the, I think the key, and this is true about any sort of freedom, um, an abundance is you have to have multiple sources. So in work, you need to have income from multiple sources, substantial income from multiple sources. And that way, if one or two sources go away, you still have some kind of income. So I realized after personally, and I think everyone has some area where they're an expert. If you've done some kind of work or some kind of education or some kind of art or have done something in your life, creative or work-related or giving or whatever it may be, or study even, you have some areas where you are an expert. And so the idea is to, is to leverage that thing that you do best, that you do better than anyone else, to find what that is, and then to find a business model that allows you to focus on that area and then all the other stuff you don't like doing, all the administrative or like the vast majority of the, the administrative work around 
that type of role, that type of function, you find other people. And me, what I did is I outsourced it to India. I found some some uh, uh, personal assistant companies and some, some contractors in India that are able to run some of the processes to my job. Now, my job was always in sales. I've worked for software companies selling solutions to large enterprise customers. And so what I what I did is I, I've always arranged the meetings, the introductions. And I realized that there's a process that works. So after many years of doing this role, I learned what the process is that works to reasonably well to line up introductions. And so what I did is I is I sort of put the, a process together with multiple people touching multiple parts that replicated what I did as an individual. And then I offered this as a service with a price per lead. And I've had as many as 10 customers at a time running campaigns. So what I've been able to do, and the, and the goal of work is maximum income and minimum time. So four hour work week, the, the goal is to get your work done to something like four hours per week where you do the essential piece that you need to do and then everything that's not essential, you outsource to other people and you pay them, but you have enough customers, enough income coming in to pay them. You, you basically focus on your core competency, what you do well, and then you sort of shift everything else to other people, pay them something reasonable for that work, give them some freedom, ideally, Many of the people I, who I work with have a similar situation as me, which is we work uh, at home. I never check what hour somebody's working. I don't care. What I do is I assign exactly what work is supposed to be done by the end, in, in a given week. And it's up to everyone to get that work done in a given week. If they don't get that work done, they get paid you know, less for that week. So it's very simple. And it's very clear what everyone's role is and what they're supposed to do. And it works. For six years, I've been running this business, working something like between five and 15 hours per week on average. And at first it was very difficult to get this going. The first, I would say, year was very was a lot more hours, a lot hard, really hard to, to get going because you have to bring in customers. And then, even then, there were some, there was a big learning curve. But in the past few years, it's been very stable and it's been a great little business. Um, you know, I don't, I don't identify with this business, it's not my identity, but it's, it's the job that I did. After I had earned my MBA, uh, I came out and I worked for some software companies and I was put into inside sales and, and, and that was my role and it was just handed to me. For a long time I resisted that. I thought that I was meant for some, some more prestigious role, whatever that means. And so I didn't take much pride in that work for a while. I didn't do a very good job, but eventually I realized, well, I think it was when I wanted to move to Europe and, and I realized that, wow, I can actually pay pay my way, pay my bills, um, you know, through this kind of work and I'm pretty good at it. So I got even better at it. I tried even harder and as I did that, as I threw myself into this work and became very good at what I do, which is a very small small niche and not very, not very um, prestigious as I said, but I became one of the best around at doing that and I was able to replicate that through through process in a, in a virtual business. So we have no offices, There's, we're not trying to prove anything about growing a company or, or, or that sort of thing. It's just a bunch of people working wherever in the world they happen to be. Um, we take our laptops, we go on vacation and then do a couple hours of work there. Um, one of our guys is, is a um, musician, so he's on the road prior to when he does sound check and has a few hours to kill prior to a gig. He will do his his assigned work on his laptop wherever he may be. So that's you know I think again. So the idea is, and it's not going to happen overnight. But this is the way to start thinking about your your future. You know where am I an expert? Where am I uniquely talented that no one else seems to be able to do this as well as I do? And people seem to want to pay for it. And at reasonable price, and you know, can that be can that be turned into a service, or do you have a product that people would like to purchase? That's an even better idea. When you have a product, then you know you just need to find some retailers and some distribution for that, and you have much easier income. Services are very hard to run um, in this way, according to this model, this sort of outsourced four-hour work week, um, you know, digital nomad model, whatever you want to call it. it doesn't mean anything. But it's an attitude. And the attitude is, once again, do what you do best 
and pay other people to do everything else that's necessary to run that business. A big piece of this is also serving customers, and this is, I've um, come to understand the idea of karma yoga. Karma yoga is the idea that we, one of the yogas or union practices is service to others without consideration of what we get in return. Now, okay, my service has a price, but outside the price, and the price, price is important in business, so you don't get taken advantage of. You can't do free, I mean, you can do free work at first to get some, some skills, but if you want to grow a business that sustains your life, you have to have a, a price model that makes sense, that you can make some profit to live on. So when you have the price, you stay firm on the price, but then everything you do is service. It's, it's, it's unconditional acceptance of whatever a customer says. Don't fight the customer. It's love. It's love. It's a practice of love. And when you and, and when I before I shifted to this practice of love or karma yoga, service to others without consideration of return, before I did that, I had some problems. I lost customers. I was a little bit greedy. I tried to uh, push things through. I tried to push invoices through. I, I kind of you know took offense to things, and that attitude came out in the emails and the calls. And over the last couple of years, when I shifted to purely a you know turn my life over to love shifted entirely to love. I took that into the business also. And, and when I did that, what I found is that I didn't have to prospect for new customers anymore. They came to me and I didn't lose them because they were pretty satisfied. If we had some issues, we'd calmly work it out just like any relationship. So, you know, love, they say, you know, all you need is love, the Beatles said, right? So, you know, the argument there is, well, love doesn't pay the rent. My argument back is that love does pay the rent because when we are loving to colleagues, customers, our bosses or whatever, business partners or partner companies, to everyone we work with, everyone we touch, every human being, if we practice love, we don't undermine relationships. We, we establish relationships. Relationships are the source of abundance. Now that abundance might be favors. It might be money coming in through your business. It might be a job opportunity. It might be any opportunity, but if we're going to not, if we're not serving others, if we're, if we're asking what we get, we're not going to get much. I was raised up on the opposite side of the sea. Learning all my life how not to be so free Now I'm not the man they thought I'd be Mama even tried but she was just too blind to see Everything that is and how it all could be On the young Side of the sea. So I said goodbye, goodbye. Now I'm free. On the opposite side. The sea. I was raised up on the opposite side of the sea Learning all my life who I am and what shall be So I learned to lie Lie The two basic states of being are love and fear. 
You fall away from love and into fear when your mind forgets your true identity. You forget that you are spirit, you are soul, you are consciousness, you are essence, you are love. These and many more words all describe the same thing. Whatever you may choose to call it, your true identity exists in the invisible realm where all truth exists. Only form is visible. Form is matter. Matter changes, and truth cannot change or else it isn't truth. Therefore, form cannot be truth. Who you truly are is in the nothingness, the unobservable, and the non-material. What we perceive as time is only the movement of matter within the now. The present moment is not static, rather it is dynamic and changing. Days are nothing more than the movement of our planet. In this eternal present, there exists both stillness and the movement of matter. The future is another word for plans. Plans are merely thoughts. There is no actual future, only how you imagine things should be, could be, or might be arranged. The past is a story that prevents you from being free in the present. Let it go. You are not limited by your past. There was no better you or better situation in the past. There will be no better you or better life in the future. Everything you are is now. You are perfect. You are complete. Everything real is already here now. What is unreal ultimately doesn't even matter. This right now is it. Don't let your mind cast darkness over what is real. Be here fully. During the month of June, I was writing songs, new songs, and ended up with 13 songs that I really liked. And I just kind of wanted to continue on with them. It was about the same time I had the idea for this documentary and I thought, you know, why not make an album to go along with this little film, um, put it all together. And these songs, I really like these songs because I think I was really writing from a different place. Um, I was trying to just, just go into consciousness and, and present moment awareness and, and uh, stillness and trying to see what kinds of lyrics, what kinds of melodies would come from that. And I think a lot of this, I think it really did come from that place, which is really where, where the books and the music that I enjoy come, come from. There's a certain quality to, to art or to, to, to writing or to music or even speaking when a person is coming from the place of not from ego, but from love or from consciousness. And really as, as any kind of artist or performer or anyone maybe giving a speech in front of a bunch of people, um, the only real preparation is to be aware, to be in the present moment, to go into the now, to notice everything about the room, to notice your breathing, to feel your inner body. And it's difficult to do that as you're writing or as you're recording songs because it is it takes a lot of work and it's quite exhausting to to really re, you know to go through the recording process. Um, so it's difficult to stay in that good place, but but I, I think it's really difficult to make anything worthwhile, any any sort of music or or art, um, if you're not feeling great, if you're not in that place of inspiration, if you don't feel good. So I've tried to stay true to that. We'll see how the music the music turns out, but I don't record or write or do anything artistically if I don't feel good. If I if I'm sure that I'm not I'm not if I'm not sure that I'm in the right place spiritually in, the, in that day, and so far it's been going really well almost deceptively well. It's quite easy this time. I've, I've recorded many times in the past. I always struggle a bit more than, than this. It almost, it almost makes me a little bit suspicious that it's, it's going too easily. Be 
relationship honesty won't work in captivity relationships honestly don't work if not accepted and free I used to think that this kind of thing yeah this sort of thing unrealistic thing was just something lonely girls posted about near some guy on the couch with different needs now I know how it feels to be with someone and still be free now I know how it feels to be with someone and still be me relationship Honesty won't work if you both cannot see that relationships honestly don't work if you don't love unconditionally. I used to think that this kind of thing, yeah, this sort of thing, unrealistic thing was just something the lonely girls posted about near some guy on the couch with different needs well, now i know how it feels to be with someone and still be me now i know how it feels to be with someone and still be free Let's try something that lonely girls post all about Near some guy on the couch with different needs Now I know how it feels to be with someone and still be free Now I know how it feels to be with someone and still be me that I could be wrong Try this yourself So now you're coming to know the source of love. You're finding that peace that can only be found in your true identity. The realm of the invisible. The realm where love exists where God exists, where consciousness exists. Your thoughts are not constantly blocking this. You have some gaps in your thoughts. It used to be like this, but your mind is starting to open up, allowing some gaps of thought where consciousness can come in. Now what happens, what's gonna happen, what you're gonna find, is that you're ready for a truly loving relationship. When you do, establish a relationship, whether it's new or existing, a loving relationship based on total honesty about everything and unconditional acceptance of everything of each other, what you find is there's no conflict. You don't ever argue. What is it to argue about? You simply state your needs and because you love each other, you try the best you can to meet those needs, but not because of fear, because of love. I want you to be happy. You want me to be happy. So if there's any disagreement, it's only about how much am I allowed to give? How much are you allowed to give? No, I don't want that. You're doing too much. No, you are. That's the kind of argument that you get in a loving relationship, a love-based relationship, not a fear-based relationship. What the world calls love is not love. The word is misunderstood. Love can only be known after you've learned to escape the ego. What the ego calls love is fearful, prideful, possessive, selfish, and jealous. This is not love. 
Love cannot be experienced this way. This is ego, the opposite of love. Love is unconditional giving and limitless creating. The ego merely gives to get, which isn't giving at all. Love is oneness. The ego negotiates and defines love through separation. Love is acceptance. The ego resists, makes rules, and manipulates. Love is forgiveness. The ego seeks power and blame, shame, judgment, condemnation, and punishment, all justified by assuming the role of victim. Love is freedom. The ego seeks to prove love through sacrifice. Love is eternal. Everything the ego does is temporary, ultimately meaningless, and washes away in time. Love is success and abundance. The loving response is the right solution to every problem and the perfect response to every challenge. The ego only attacks, causing more problems, further separation, and blocking abundance. Abundance cannot flow into your life if love is not pouring out. The ego cuts off abundance, miscreates, and produces a catastrophic trail of failure. This is how most people live. But a life aligned with love is so much more fun, so easy and blissful. So this kind of relationship is actually very easy to do. You're not making constant judgments about each other. You're not distrusting each other. You're not threatening each other. You're not punishing each other. You're not using rewards or any form of attack or blame. You have no resentment. In time, it takes a little bit of time to trust and to develop this style of relationship, but in time you lose jealousy. You begin to recognize jealousy as a violent emotion to try to get the other person to separate from the world and join with you. So you begin to understand that what you have with this person, when, when this is mutual, this kind of loving relationship, you begin to understand that nothing can threaten that relationship. Whatever you, you have between you, which is a perfect connection on the level of the soul where everyone is actually the same, identical. Every level, every person at the level of the soul has exactly the same needs. To be loved, to feel safe, to feel good, to be inspired, to be happy. It's not that complicated. And when you, when you connect with a person on that level, and don't let that situation stuffed, don't let the world's rules about relationships get in the way, you would have no reason to leave that relationship, so there's no reason for jealousy. There's no secrets. Even if you want to go and explore sexual things with other people, you're doing it in total openness and honesty, and if there's a real need, your partner will understand. And there may not be a need for either of you. You have to let go and let that be possible. As hard as that is, that's the hardest one. But there cannot be an exception. There cannot be any rule because a rule is belief in separation, which is belief in the ego. If you can truly commit to knowing that you have all the love you need, you don't need it from one person, there's no lack of love in the world, it's all within you. If you truly understand the source of value, then you can be totally sure and confident to move forward in a relationship with this person. This is stronger than marriage. Total commitment to love, to unconditional acceptance and honesty and openness. You don't have to define anything else, just that. You can move forward, you can have children, because you know that this person, and I'm sure you're going to talk about this also, because you're talking about everything openly and honestly, but you're going to talk about this, and you're going to know that this person is not going to separate you from your child. There's not going to be a custody battle where you lose access to your child. And trust me, that's probably one of the most painful things in life to deal with, losing access to a young child as a loving father or mother. So, be careful about getting into a relationship with someone who believes in separation because they're going to turn that separation against you from day one and all the way through your life and you're going to love that person it's going to be painful but they're going to believe in separation as the solution when it's the cause of all the problems 
from, the, from day one it's the cause of all the problems and they continued to, to ramp it up to go even more separation set even more firm rules cut communication even more now move out get out I want to teach you a lesson you'll come back when you're ready to be a good husband or good wife you do not want a relationship or a marriage with this person unless you want war there's no happiness here I've been living in a time When all my friends and I Are seeing through the lies Deceiving Yet we can't believe in this old time And here's the big surprise Through these eyes We're seeing Perfect stillness being so alive and you are waking up to find how it feels to be alive to everything inside you see it. We exist in freedom this whole time And here's the big surprise We don't need the lies Do 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 We reach and deep inside To the place we still hide to leave the past behind Leaving And what we have been dreaming this whole time And here's the big surprise We had nothing to hide Do 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 What do you do? What do you do? Do with me, can I do, do for you There's only love, there's only bliss There's only joy, there's only this We are living free of time Ego's left behind It's good to be alive So one of the things I started doing more recently, a lot more often, is I, I go uh, mountain biking about every other day. And uh, whenever I do, I take about an hour long ride. And I come up here and take a break at this beautiful old chapel, about 120 years old. And um, it's about the only place that I ever do any kind of prayer. I just started this recently. I've always been, for a long time, very uncomfortable with any kind of prayer. Um, but I, I learned that really prayer is just asking God to align you with with spirit. I think if a person is is going to live in a way that they're aligned with love and um, in a state of consciousness, I think actually one of the most most underestimated areas to look at is your structure and your routines. I guess most people probably wouldn't associate a set of routines or a daily structure with something that would make you happier or, or more peaceful or um, feel more free. But I think that this is a really important area. I don't think it's possible to to live permanently in a state, in an awakened state, um, to, to live fully in love, you know, to avoid the ups and downs, I think you need to have some structure. And that involves a daily practice. I call it a daily spiritual practice, but there's more to it than just the spiritual side. So I don't, I'm not saying that I know the answer for everyone. Everyone has different needs and, and different plans and different things work for different people. But I will, I will share with, with you what I do every day. 
and what I've been doing for every day for the past couple of years. And it really has been, I think, a key, a key reason why I've been able to stay in this kind of good place. So every day, it's not enough just to read a great book like, you know, Power of Now, Eckhart Tolle, or, or Course in Miracles, if you don't mind the Christian um, the Christian language in, in that book, it still points to the same truths. You can read, you know, classics like the Bhagavad Gita or Tao Te Ching. You can read my book, uh, Be Love, behind me right there. You can see that. <laughs> you can see the, the paper quilled um, cover of Be Love. Um, anyway, you can read a book like this and you can be totally inspired and you put it down and you try to live this way. You're like, I've changed forever. I get it. I totally get it. Wow, this changed my world. You put the book down, you go on about your routine, and after a number of days, it's the same thing as like after a vacation. After the days go by, the weeks go by, you go back to your normal self. You know, the same things kind of set you off, and your ego takes over again, and you're right back where you started, and you think, well, that didn't work. Well, the thing about any kind of spiritual practice is it has to be daily. Okay, so it can be just five or 10 or 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be a massive undertaking, but you do need to connect with some kind of spiritual teaching once a day. Um, I do that. I used to do that just by, by listening to an audiobook on um, the way, you know, taking my daughter to school or going to the gym, at the gym. I, I don't know how many times I listen to the same books um, by Deepak Chopra or by, you know, um, Marianne, Marianne Williamson or, or many others uh, again and again at the gym. So you don't have to spend any extra time. It can be just doing things you're already doing. Um, beyond that, you do need to have a meditation practice. Okay, so meditation, again, it doesn't need to be difficult. This is gonna take a little bit of time, 15 minutes per day minimum, ideally twice per day or, or one 20 minute session. And I would recommend finding a guided meditation. Although I've not tried transcendental meditation, I've not, tried other forms. I, I mean, of course, I have tried to sit still and close my eyes and just and just try to meditate. But I find it much easier with a good guided meditation. I use Meditation Oasis. It's an, an app, and they also have the free meditations on the website. And I do it every single day. I've done this for this meditation, I think, for three or four years every day. And meditation opens up a gap in your thinking so that some of the beauty and some of the spiritual, um, the light, the light can enter through your, your mind. It's, un, it's unblocked. And it teaches you to, to disidentify with your thoughts, to not take your thoughts seriously, to let them go, to have moments where there is no thought. Absolute truth cannot be changed or threatened. Truth needs no defense. Everything in the realm of matter the world of the physical, even the earth, planets, and stars are, in a sense, not absolute truth. Matter changes. What doesn't change is nothingness. What is true is therefore nothing, invisible, imperceptible. Truth lies in nothingness. This is the essence of spirituality. Everything you care most about is invisible. Love, health, inspiration, how you feel, happiness. We chase after the material, yet what matters to us is non-material. All the great spiritual traditions teach us not to become attached. The reason for this is quite simple. Becoming attached to that which changes is a mistake. If your identity becomes attached to possessions, status, a relationship, or anything else having to do with the physical realm, then you're becoming fixed upon that which will change. This is what is referred to as building your house upon sand, and it is the source of suffering. You are the soul, the essence, the spirit, which is of course invisible. Your true identity is connected with the empty space between the planets and stars, the nothingness. Nothingness cannot be studied, described, or understood by the mind. But when you awaken, you'll become aware of this other realm, the realm in which you are perfect, complete, and eternal. Freedom is a really misunderstood concept. Um, freedom is not being able to act out 
and attack people and do nasty things. That's not freedom, that's just ego. Freedom is what happens when your soul is free to be totally honest, to hide nothing, to control no one, to hold on to nothing, to hold on to no one. And if you are living in a way that you accept unfreedom, if you accept that you're unfree in your relationship or in your job or some area of life, then you're not free. And it's painful not to be free. You're limiting your potential to be you. So, anywhere in your life you accept separation, you accept the rules, any rules imposed upon you by, by a partner, by authority. Now sometimes you don't want to battle people or authority. You might go along with rules and not, dis, and not disobey the rules. But you cannot allow rules to restrict the way you express yourself what you choose to do with other people or alone. You are free. We are free as people to say what we feel and believe, to worship, to write, to sing, to dance, to connect with each other, to make friendships, to make relationships, to do whatever two people can do together, to create together. Do not allow anyone to put a rule saying you can't do that. This is the source of great pain and misery. So this really is the foundation of the idea behind um, I Am, which is currently it's being built as a mobile app, but this is really the, what I've come to understand over the past I don't know, 17 years, is that this is the purpose of my life. To form human connections based on mutual, compatible needs between good, loving people who are ready to, to, to cooperate, to, to form friendships, to serve each other. So the mobile app, ultimately this has to be made decentralized, but as of now it's a mobile app, and by the time this movie comes out, um, it should be out, so check your app store for I Am by InfoBeing, <laughs> because it's not enough just to, just to watch this movie and just to understand these ideas. We have to go beyond just talking and reading and lecturing each other. We have to go to live the ideals, and that involves you connecting with other people. You can't do it alone. The source of power for all centralized institutions of any form, banks, <laughs> retailers, governments, schools, the source of power is our belief that they have power over us, okay? So when the government comes in and says, you guys can't, you can't do this, two people can't meet and, and, and talk, we have to listen to your conversation, do we believe that or do we think that we have the right as two free human beings to be able to connect and do things together? So we have to make up our minds, and to do that we have to understand the idea of decentralization, which really just means freedom from institutions. The media has its agenda. They want us to they want to frame reality for us so that we so that we think that what's on the news is what's happening in the world. What's happening in the world in reality is what's happening right around us in our own world. We have to believe in what we see, what we perceive and our true identity where we can't be threatened, where no authority, they can put us in prison but they can't take away that, the, the observer, the freedom. They can kill you but what is true is eternal. You cannot be threatened. You will live on after death as this observer. Nothing real can be destroyed, it only changes form. So when we come to believe in our own power to create, in our own abundance, in the idea that everything we seek is in this invisible realm, we don't need to get it in the world, we don't need to buy it from a corporation, there's nothing real, nothing of value to be found there. Everything in value, of value is already within you, it already is you. 
So now that you know this, you can have perfect relationships, loving relationships with partners in freedom. You can be a great loving parent and not side with the school over your child and break the relationship. You don't break relationships anymore because you serve people, you love them, you give. You give, you create. And it feels great. Love is get is giving, it's not getting. You can't get love. It doesn't feel like love when you're just getting. It's a reciprocal thing where the giving act is the same as the receiving act. There's no difference. When you give something of value to the world, money flows in, fame flows in, it's the same act, it's the idea of doing that thing of value. So we do this in a decentralized way, we keep our wealth, a, vast, a great majority or a great percentage of our wealth in cryptocurrency and the blockchain, Bitcoin, Ethereum. We connect with each other to do projects around the home, to start bands, to collaborate, to start new businesses together, whatever it is that your passion is, travel somewhere, find somebody to do that. You meet compatible people who have expressed the same need, the same want, and you meet together and you're open and you're, and you're good people who know these values. This is a consciousness revolution. It's the next era of human development. You look at the trees behind me. What we see are individual trees. But beneath the surface, you have a root system that overlaps, connects. And I've even read recently that there's communication happening between trees via the roots. They're communicating what kind of resources they're going to give to the other tree or take for themselves. They're growing in a way that, that they're cooperating to get the sunlight they need. So beneath the surface and above the surface, the tree is complete. If you look at a tree only above the surface or cut it off at the at the trunk, it will die. She says it's so, so it's so. Today I found out that from my ex, my ex, um, the mother of Isabella, that she's taking her to Prague to live with her her boyfriend, I'm trying to to deal with this in a way that is according to, my, to the ideals, but I'm having a hard time. You don't want to see your child, you know, go through a hard time. A whole new place, a new family, and to be away from her dad. I feel like we have a really special connection. And I'm trying to stay centered here. Of course, I'll be there for her no matter what and do whatever I can, but this is a hard day. My ex, she could easily move to Prague and she has a beautiful home here. It's 12 hours away there flight or a train ride, but there are solutions where she could easily let Isabella stay at her home, an eight-year-old stay at her same school, be with both parents, and yet she chooses to go to a situation where it'll be very difficult for me to be able to be there for her. School takes up most of the year, and then during holidays she's going to want to travel, she's going to want holidays with her, with her grandparents and I don't know where I'll factor in and you know it's a situation where it becomes very tempting as a parent to try to start a war but I know that's not the way Mommy. I know that there's a certain truth that goes deeper than what I can do with judges or with threats or with anything or lawyers and I know that I have the relationship with my daughter, and I know that long term, um, 
she probably needs to go through through some challenge some challenge we all do and I, I can't control what happens I just have to be there lovingly the most that I possibly can but I can tell you I'm really angry with I'm really hurt by her mother Because, because Isabella is going to be hurt. You know, I already, I already deal with the pain. She's never, she hasn't been fair since we've been separated. She hasn't been fair. I've only had Isabella maybe 25% of the time, which isn't fair. Isn't right. But I've tolerated it because of threats and because of other reasons. And and in the end, this is what happens. So I'm just grateful that I have such a beautiful relationship with that beautiful soul. And time isn't a factor. I'll have to, if I have to wait longer to connect with her. That's what I'll have to do. It's not about me at all. I just will do anything to. I'll move to Prague if I have to, but even then I won't get access half the time. So this is what fathers go through for the terrible punishment of being ourselves. It's just a situation. It's just external. It's form. And I know that the relationship I have with Isabella is something that's from a different dimension. It's difficult for me to see what's happening right now because this man is the sweetest human being I know and doesn't deserve anything like that. It's really killing me to know that there are so many this sweet fathers out there who are treated like this because they're just fathers. They're not, you know, they're not mothers because mothers are perfect, right? Always. I'm really angry and I'm holding myself back to see, from saying something because I would use a lot of bad words if I had to. I guess it's hard to understand because you have to go into details about the situation, but the thing is that there is there are so many other ways that she could have her needs met as a woman and and take care of her daughter. But really her need is this illusion that she needs to have a family where there's all these kids and, and, and two and a, and a man and a woman together under one roof. And for her to have that illusion, she's, she has to basically try to eliminate us from Isabella's life, yet the thing is, we you know, we, <laughs> you're pregnant with her brother, and she has two amazing families, and she's trying to cut one of them. Now, what if I try to do that? I don't think it's even possibly a, a comprehensible. I can't even imagine looking in, in Isabella's eyes and explaining that I'm taking her away from her home and from her mother, basically. Oh, don't worry, she'll visit once in a while when she can. Yeah, because of your dream, right? Because of my dream to have a normal family. I would love that with Isabel. I would love to be with her every single day. But when it became impossible for me and her mother to be together, I realized that I have to give up on that dream. That it has to be a different dream.
Don't you feel there's something in the air that keeps us so damn strong? How sweet, how sweet is our song? so weak you were there you were strong it never matters what we see or how long we go on don't you feel there's something in the air that keeps us so damn strong how sweet how sweet is our song How steep or how long we go on Don't you feel there's something in the air That keeps us so damn strong How sweet, how sweet is our song So it's a week after I found out that um, my ex, I hate to even call her my ex, that um, Eva is taking Isabella to Prague to start school there and, um, and to try to start over and create a new family with her boyfriend. And it's been a really hard week. Um, I've had, I've been with Isabella the entire week and now it's middle August and I had a chance to to really spend almost all my time kind of with her work is kind of manageable and as precious as every moment is the hard thing is that even the most precious moments are the ones that are saddest because you feel like something is going to be changed you constantly feel what she's going to go through it's hard to explain if you're not a parent. Probably I cried a couple hundred times. There's always kind of tears about to come from, from my eyes. Uh, I took her camping alone, just me and her, for a couple days, went to a water park. And, um, you know, tried not to let my emotions cause her any harm. And, I think all in all it was a success and that I think she understands that I love her and that I was willing to fight for her. Now, fighting. One of the things that, that I think bothers people about, um, about the idea of kind of going down the spiritual path is that we see a lot of people who we know and all of us know someone who's, who's you know, who's, who's pursuing this spiritual path, path and, and some people end up being very passive, almost fake, and you try to accept everything and try to project per perfect peace no matter what, and I think that's one of the things that, that kind of turns people off to the idea of, of living differently, um, living along, aligning with love away from the ego, away from the idea of separation, is that we don't want to lose that sense of being alive, that sense of the drama of life. And I haven't been challenged like this for a, for a while. 
you know, a couple of years ago, I decided to put all my faith in, in love and, and escape the ego and, and I wrote my book and, and I've lived that way for a few years. And I haven't really faced any challenges as big as this one and I'm grateful for that. And I realize maybe I'm a little bit spoiled <laughs> if this is my biggest problem and I'm grateful for that. But I can tell you that it did activate a little bit of ego because I was trying to solve the situation through some, some attacks, some threats trying to manipulate the situation. I wanted to even, I was even seriously consider using um, social services to, to send them back home. And I made threats just to get attention. You know, Marshall Rosenberg says that any, any um, attack is, is a tragic expression of an unmet need. And that's what it came down to is, is I realized the extent to which I have an unmet need to be um, well, to be a part of, to be a regular part of my daughter's life and to be there for her in the way that only I can be. And so there was some attack, there was some anger. And so obviously that comes from the ego. There was an activation. Now I could also say it was part, it was, it was intuition because as I learned through some of the meditations, the guided meditations I've, I've been doing, part of acceptance, part of unconditional acceptance is also accepting those moments when you are not behaving perfectly according to some prescribed belief system. To accept your feelings, to accept your reactions, to accept um, whatever you need to express and then return to the calm, peaceful state of love and acceptance. So I had to really forgive myself for the way that I reacted. And I didn't like myself very much in the past week because at times I realized that I wasn't letting go. I wasn't practicing perfect, <laughs> how do you say? Well, acceptance of what is. And, um, but in the end, well, it's not the end. It's never the end until everything works out perfectly. I don't know the end. I don't, I don't know the reason for what's happening, but I know there is a reason because life does have a plan for each of us. It's a cliche, but there's a curriculum to our lives that, you know, as a parent or as someone who loves someone, you try to prevent the suffering, but they need to go through what they need to go through. Living for the future in any form is a distortion of life. The religious seek heaven. The political ideologues seek utopia. Whenever a future goal or destination becomes so important that we become willing to sacrifice the present, all is lost. This is what is meant by the ends do not justify the means. Any true vision, goal, or destination must be accessible immediately in the present. That which is real is eternal and unchanging. If what you seek is beyond reach now, then it cannot be considered eternal and therefore is not real. You are sacrificing all that is real in pursuit of an illusion. This is a tragedy in any and every form. When Jesus referred to the kingdom of heaven, he was not referring to a future destination in the sky. He was telling us about consciousness, the awakened state, enlightenment, which is accessible only now. Of course, the church has distorted this message by having us believe that this life is only meant as a preparation for death. Life is supposed to be hell. Death is supposed to be your reward. This has created a sickness of fear, obedience, and suffering in the lives of countless people over hundreds and hundreds of years. Nothing external, nothing in the realm of form, is required first before you can enter the state of bliss, awareness, utopia, or nirvana. Heaven is now. You are meant to go there now and to bring others along. It's three o'clock in the morning. I just got back from the hospital and very excited and relieved and grateful and in peace with the idea that my son has been born. 
It's a very fast uh, delivery. It was about eight hours from the first contraction to delivery. And the past three hours were a lot of screaming. But I heard the moment the baby was born, Leonard was born, 2.15 a.m. And I cried and I felt enormous relief and joy and peace. And I, when Yuzana's screaming and crying stopped, I felt enor enormous peace about that. The strange thing is I actually didn't mind her screaming during birth, strangely, because I felt like it, the, the more she was screaming, the more it was happening. She was pushing, it was happening quickly, and I wanted it to be happening quickly. And um, they finally let me, let me see them, and there, there he was. Little baby, kind of half sleeping. And Zana was pretty much herself. It was just wonderful. I called my parents a couple times. And um, now it's 3 a.m. and here I am. So. In sleep, a terrible nightmare causes so much disturbance that you eventually escape that dream by waking. Now, from the awakened perspective, you realize that it was only a dream. There's nothing to be afraid of. Calm settles over you. You close your eyes and drift off into a beautiful sleep. To believe you are only this physical form, this body and mind, in this place and time, is like being lost in a dream without knowing it. To be spiritually unaware and the egoic state is to experience the ups and downs of temporary highs followed by suffering and depression. All the while, you're afraid because you feel vulnerable, seeing this temporary existence as all there is. Terrible suffering, like a terrible dream, reminds us that there is a way out. We remember that it is possible to awaken Life gives you whatever level of suffering you need to reach this point of escape from the dream. If a little bit of suffering doesn't do the trick, here comes a bit more, and still more. And finally, a challenge so impossible, a pain so deep, that you reach your limit. Spiritual awakening is like coming up for air, entering another realm, finding peace and love like you've never known. From this higher perspective, life is no longer scary. You can rest your head on the pillow and go on, this time without the ups and downs, without the suffering, in peace and stillness. This time the colors are more alive, there's beauty everywhere, and life becomes a good dream. These spiritual teachings are pointers that I hope you'll remember when suffering becomes too great. Better yet, don't wait for any more suffering. Come up for air now, awaken, escape the ego. More people than ever are awakening to presence, consciousness becoming aware of itself. Awaken from life while you're still alive. So don't you tell me how I got to keep control. If you could come to the treetops, then we could let love flow. Just let it flow, let it flow. Is there love inside your heart or don't you know? We got love inside us There's nothing to find in place and time We got love inside us There's nothing to find in place and time We got love inside us there's nothing to find in place and time We got love inside us Nothing to find in place and time So don't you tell me of that life I used to know If you could come to the treetops Then we could let it blow Just let it blow, let it blow is there love inside your heart, or don't you know? Now 
that I live in the tree tops. I don't know what nothing was for. Now that I've seen all that we've got.